um, because we're trying to build an ongoing conversation around uh, basically the future of theater, the future of theater pedagogy. It all started uh, at the top of the pandemic uh, when uh, we wanted to explore how do we go forward during this time. And then we realized that we are just constantly working towards figuring out a future for which we are not rehearsed. Um, and that's how this whole conversation started. And then we were joined, then Amy ran a beautiful series um, to, in the second half of the season, first season of, uh, of these conversations. And then we just realized that these conversations can endure and grow on, and that's what we're doing. We're just holding space. And now joining us in the space holding is Mwenya Kabwe and Mgeni Nchali, who are both who are both, I'm just always proud of the fact that I can say the word. <laughs> um, yeah, who are both um, really uh, have joined us as co-conspirators, co-curators. Each of the four curators is on some kind of a quest um, where we're trying to figure out something, we're trying to ask questions. But the conversation, but the quest is a, con uh, is a, is a quest that is, uh, that is joined by all of you. And so without any further ado, um, and you can always look at all of the conversations online. Uh, they're all on the Drama School Mumbai website. Um, and Falguni has given you a link to the videos for season one. Um, but you can just go to the website and get everything over there because there are also like reported pieces there. Um, uh, little excerpts and summaries of each and every conversation that Falguni has written um, quite well. So without further ado, I open the floor and give it to our curator for the day, uh, Mgeni. Hi, hello everyone. Thank you, Jehan. Um, yeah, so uh, you would have seen that today's discussion is broadly focused on this question of what I guess a new African kind of classicism might look like in the theatre. Really want to kind of tease apart this question of firstly the relationship to um, kind of a European or quote unquote colonial um, theatrical inheritance and also to think about how we might imagine new forms that are both responding to that history, but perhaps also open up new terrain for articulating an aesthetics that might sit outside of that realm entirely. Um, as Jayhan's already said, I am joined today by colleagues Mark Fleischmann from the Center for Theatre, Dance and Performance Studies and Mandel Motor as well. Um, they also work with the Magnet Theatre and I'm going to quickly ask them to introduce themselves just to tell us a bit about themselves and their work before um, we launch into the meat of the discussion. Um, Mark, can I hand over to you to say hello quickly? Um, um, thanks, Mbongeni. Say Mark or Mark. <laughs> you can go, my friend. You, no, 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 you go first, seniority. No, 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 no. I think, uh, I think my ancestors will be really angry if I uh, go first. The adult must go first, the elder. <laughs> okay, good, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. Um, um, as Mogheni said, my name is Mark Fleischmann. I am Professor of Theatre at the University of Cape Town in the Center for Theatre, Dance and Performance Studies and Co-Artistic Director of Magnet Theatre. Um, I've been in these two positions for a very long time, for uh, over 30 years. Um, and my uh, interests, I suppose, are um, currently I'm working on a project which is uh, reimagining tragedy um, in the global south um, with a particular focus on Africa um, together with Mandla um, and various other people. Um, but I have in the past been involved with various projects that bring the practice of, of theater and performance and research together um, in various ways um, and have run a number of multi-year thematic projects around um, remembering in the post-colony and about migration in Africa, um, broadly speaking. Um, uh, yeah, so um, that's kind of the work that I do. Uh, as I said, I also work in Magnet Theatre together with Mandla and Jenny Resnick, and we, um, Magnet is a theater company, a 30 year old South African independent theater company that focuses, well, started off as what we call the physical theater company, but has developed into something more than that, I think, um, uh, with a much 
broader sense of of theatrical practice. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Manza. Um, thanks, Mbongeni. Uh, good morning and good afternoon or evening to everyone. Um, my name is Mand Lambotwe. I also work for the University of Cape Town for the Center for Theatre, Dance and Performing Arts Studies. I, and, uh, and, and also I am the co-artistic director for Magnet Theatre, uh, working with Mark and, and, and Jenny Resnick. Uh, I also um, a founder and a, um, a director for my company called Mad and Fire Parables. Um, Mark have uh, extended what Magnet Theatre is and what we do. Over and above, I've also been one of the people that spearheaded what we call the community groups intervention. Uh, and now it's called Culture Games, where we find a way of bridging the gap between <clears throat> The, 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 the mainstream kind of theater and the sidelined or marginalized communities within the arts industry. Uh, and also my, I think my, my interest of work has always been around uh, what, what I called the excavation of the buried stories to feed the living, um, looking at what the intergenerational trauma has done, but also working from the premise of knowledge that uh, uh, we are a wounded society and my theater has always been in search for healing, but the healing that is based on what has been buried by colonialism and apartheid when it comes to theater and performance. And my work has always been that, both in language and in aesthetic and in content of the work that I work. So hence I always lean into archives uh, in a way and search for the herbs, what I call the herbs. Um, in trying to mitigate and, and, and engage in the process of searching for healing, not as a director or as a script writer, but also as a facilitator of the process of theater making within its own processes. Okay, and that speaks to my work at the, at the University of Cape Town when I, when I teach. My work is based on that. It's based on those diversifying forms of, of, of meaning starting from me before I go out and acknowledge what that means in, in, in things. Okay, and I'm also involved with Mark with, with uh, Retex Product pro Project, uh, which looks at the uh, uh, Greek classical work uh, um, uh, through the eyes, um, African eyes and Global South. And I'm, I'm in the process of uh, refusing the frame and finding the frame that is before that frame in looking for those kind of tragedies um, in African context, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's me. Great. Um, <laughs> thank you, Manza uh, and, and Mark. So I guess a useful place for us to start might be in addressing, you know, the kind of quote unquote key term that, that seems to be animated in this discussion and this question of of classicism, I guess, or the classics, um, and in the context of Africa. So um, that's where I'm, I'm going to start. I'm, I'm interested in hearing a little more about what you think um, this notion of the classical means um, and what work it does discursively, um, whether in terms of uh, you know, your choices about making theater or how you teach theater. Um, and, and kind of thinking a little about what's at stake in bounding out a terrain that we define or name as the classical, especially in a context like South Africa, right? as Mandalay pointed out, um, we're engaging with, with uh, kind of dealing with a colonial inheritance um, through various practices, we call it um, excavation or unearthing as a means of healing. There seems to be a kind of distinct relationship between uh, the work that you're interested in doing, the, the outcomes of that work, um, and, and how, I'm interested in thinking more about how it turns around this, this reimagining or repositioning of what the classics might mean in our context. And that can be in terms uh, of working magnet or it's, it's, it's a general question. You can, I mean, it's, it's, it's to both of you, I guess. Um, so perhaps Mark, you could start uh, by telling us a little about how that, that affects your work with magnet or 
how that kind of reveals this thinking in some way. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, oh, sorry. I don't mind either or either or. <laughs> um, just so I, I want to start off by saying that that um, we didn't choose this topic. So uh, it was kind I of didn't. placed in front of us, <laughs> and so um, I'm going to try to think through some of these things on the fly, so to speak. So the first. When I think of the concept of classicism or the classics, um, I imagine them in three, that sense in three ways. Um, the first is classicism or the classics as pertaining to the particular Greco-Roman literary or dramatic tradition um, that has been inherited into our context uh, through colonialism. So that is, um, that is one very um, circumscribed, if you like, uh, way of understanding the classics. And it's still the way that it's taught in our university and in most other South African universities. The classics are Greek, Greece and Rome. Um, the second is to understand classicism as something with that, that defines excellence or distinctiveness that has a timeless significance, a kind of enduring value uh, that becomes foundational over time. Um, um, and the third is classicism as that which is pre-modern, that which the modern emerges from or sets itself against. Um, and in terms of the, the first uh, thought, um, I'm interested in the ways in which that particular Greco-Roman tradition, but in, in my case, particularly the Greek tragedies of the first century BC, um, is mobilized under colonialism, both by uh, the settler communities or the colonizer communities and the reaction by the so-called colonized or, or, or indigenous communities or native communities. Um, and then in the second instance, the place of this body of work in the post-colonial. So what does it mean now um, in South African terms, post-apartheid for this? What is its persistence and what is its relevance on how does it function in, in this time? And, and to, a, to a great extent, that is what is being explored under the retags banner. The second and third um, definitions, if you like, um, are relate to the question of whether there are alternative classicisms, whether the, there are plural senses of the classics that go beyond that Greco-Roman tradition. Um, and in that respect, the answer on one level is obviously yes, they are. But, um, and, and it's easier to see or clearer in some contexts outside of the Western European context than in others. So for example, mm -hmm. in the Indian context, it's quite, it has been argued for a long time that there, and the British colonial machinery recognized this from very early on, that there was a very clear, distinct classical tradition existing within what we now call India. Um, uh, that that goes back for centuries, and that it, that um, and to that extent, um, according to Harish Trivedi, for example, um, the Greek and Latin texts were not taught um, within the colonial education system in India in the way that they were taught throughout Africa because of the existence of the Sanskrit tradition. Um, in Africa, the situation is much more complex because there is no obvious written or literary classical tradition of aesthetics to draw on. So then the question arises, is it possible um, to describe an oral um, tradition as being a classical tradition? Mm. Or is, uh, you know, because in some sense, and this is something that Manda has mentioned before, is there a distinction between tradition and a traditional form and a classical form? Mm. So 
in that sense, is the traditional something owned by a group um, that is a particular cultural group owns their traditions and and whereas the classical is something that is produced by individual individuals within that group. So it might be based on a tradition, but it has its own individual uh, manifestation in some kind of way. Um, so that's one question. Can we understand the, and, and now I'm again need to make the distinction that I'm to a large extent, even though I use the word, uh, I'm using the word Africa, really referring to Southern Africa because yeah. the, the situation becomes far too complex when we start to move around the rest of the continent. Because there clearly are much longer traditions of writing that exist in other parts of, of the African continent um, and particularly in relation to those parts of the continent that were influenced by Islam um, from a very early stage. Um, mm -hmm. But in Southern Africa, that doesn't occur to the same extent. And so what you get is a much more um, established and long standing tradition of traditions, let's say traditions of orality um, in forms like storytelling, poetry, dance, song cycles, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one sense in which we can understand the classicism. The other sense is what I would call a more modern classicism. And in the South African context, I'm referring to the beginnings of written um, literary output, um, particularly by Black South Africa, what we now call South Africans, in um, the late 19th century and early 20th century. So the particular writings of people like the Jababus or Esikem Kai or Herbert Lomo or Sol Plaiki, et cetera, et cetera. So that was really at the cusp of what we might call African modernity or Southern African modernity um, emerging out of that um, kind of oral cultural um, base or foundation. Now in both of those cases, I think you can see these things in like as opposites or as two sides of the coin. Because on the one hand, in terms of definition two, where the classicism is something which is distinctive and has timeless significance and everything like that, um, clearly these forms um, need to be valued and we need to find a way to, uh, to value these forms relative to the impositions um, of Western forms that came in through colonialism. On the other hand, in terms of the definition three, which is classicism as anything that is pre-modern, there is a kind of reduction of these forms to what we might call the folkloric or something other than culture, something other than art, something that is not quite up to the mark, so to speak. Um, everything that existed before, in our case, the modern theater was introduced into Southern Africa. Um, it doesn't quite have the same status. So the questions really here revolve around um, what in, I suppose, the various methods or approaches that have been taken in the process of what might be called decolonialist thesis, um, as described by Walter Minulo and, and Ricardo Vasquez, for example, in the, in the Latin American context, the ways in which we go about a, historicizing, B, delinking, um, three, creating pluralities, um, and, and bringing forth that which has been silenced, giving status to that which has been denigrated as a result of uh, the colonial imposition, not so much as a way of saying this rather than that, but understanding a pl pluriversity, as they say, um, of, of different kinds of classicisms, different kinds of foundations um, for the kinds of contemporary work that might be happening in, in what we might call the post mm. 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 Yeah. Um, start. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. That was incredibly rich. And, and I especially like how um, the three definitions that you're working through um, identify different kinds of impulses that may undergird how we we choose to kind of frame this this idea of the classics. 
Um, and I'm particularly taken by the kind of common sense understanding, I guess, of the classics as something that we um, kind of attach a value proposition to, um, or that are trying to produce a kind of value that may have not been marked in the past out of. Um, but also this idea of perhaps a kind of modern classical tradition that emerges after a particular point as, as the beginning um, of that. And, you know, Mandla, I, and then also I want to circle back to this idea of, of the gesture of historicizing, delinking, and creating pluralities, right, as a response to these inheritances. Um, but Mandla, this is, this is something that I obviously see at, at, you know, at work in your work too, is this, um, explicit insistence on on taking those non-literary forms so kind of the oral historical forms that that our culture collectively is grounded in here um as seriously as one might have those original kind of european texts right that tend to ground the dramatic tradition um i wonder if you could speak a little more about um your work and and how you're kind of tacking towards the beginnings, right, of, of, of how you create, like what inspires you, why you choose the stories you do, and, and, and what you believe the politics are in, in those particular kinds of choices that you're making. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think uh, in my introduction, I, I, I mentioned briefly uh, what inspires me or what drives me to, 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 to create the work that I create. And I, I think, I mean, just to, to draw a little bit of, of my background that, in, you know, I, it started in high school as uh, I was a political educator uh, who's responsible to mobilize, politicize and organize the students during late eighties in, in a way. And, and finding out that actually uh, speeches and, and rallies alone don't really inspire inspire what we wanted to do with the students that resulted in us actually finding um, different ways of engaging with students. And we didn't look that far. We looked at our practices and our cultural and, and, and traditional practices that are performative um, in a way of uh, passing that kind of a message. And for me, that has always been an inspiration of, of, of educating, empowering, and, and dealing with illnesses of our societies. And, and even now, that has evolved, of course, you know, um, through, through my work and by looking at what, by realizing the fact that as a, as a nation, as a society, particularly as Black people, that we are really wounded and something has been stolen from us and we have been stripped of our identity. And, and, and at, the, at, the, at the heart of that, it was a, a systematic, kind of, of journey of colonialism and apartheid to attack the, the confidence of, of, of black people in both in language, in, in performing art forms, in, 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 um, in, in, um, in, in traditional practices that hold the society together. So my, 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 my work has always been, has, I've always, I mean, I mean this thing of, of, of classic uh, or classicism that you are referring to in, in my head, because of every time we refer to that, we refer to, to Europe, you know, and it has always been better, bigger, and if you deal with it, you'll be successful, as opposed to when we do the umtichim or the traditional dance, which can, you can trace as far as long before the arrival of the colonialism is not regarded as that. As even if you see it right through into the futures, even now that it has a particular value and it draws a particular kind of influence and it has endured in terms of the time, you know, um, it both even in see in songs, you know, and Mark mentioned the oral tradition of, of storytelling. Uh, um, those things were not re recognized as classics, you know. And I kept on, I, I was bothered by them. I was quite agitated about that. That, you know, when there's a festival of dance, it will say that there's a classical festival of dance, but you won't see any kind of um, uh, traditional dancing or, or genres that, that actually uh, um, uh, form their part as far as before the colonialism uh, 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 in, 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 you know. so, so for me, I, was, I have always been bothered by that in, in, in a way. Um, 
and and in a way that I've just discarded even the terminology itself. I didn't mind. I was creating work, not in reference to what it was not part of us, but in reference to us searching for that identity, but also feeding into the confidence. You know, um, uh, you know, Mbongeni, um, if you want to kill the nation, if you want to kill a person, take away his or her confidence to of himself or herself. If he, he take it, take it away. That person can become anything. And if, if my work and my theater or the theater that I do and the storytelling uh, in a way that is based on cultural practices, rituals that we grew up with that, that re actually introduce and resurface these practices of, of strong performative kind of nature in, in our society. And then for me, I wouldn't be doing what, I, what, what I'm doing really. So hence mm -hmm. I recognize my theater uh, and the ways of teaching in that theater that opens up a platform for all of us as, as, as plurality and interdisciplinary work as a search for that particular healing. And I think for me, that has always been the future. It evolves because illnesses of the society will always be there. So like the poets, like praise poets, the classical praise poets in an African context, that they are, they are kind of praising, their kind of practice has always involved depending on the illnesses of that particular society or the illnesses of that particular individual that they're responsible to drive and direct the, the, the community. So my, my theater responds to those illnesses. And at this particular moment is the illness uh, and the wound of, of, of coloniality, not really colonialism, but the results of what they have survived colonial, co colonialism. You know, uh, that, that, that actually it's, it's in our system, it's in our academic system, it's in our language, it's, it's you know, um, uh, and how do we begin to, to engage with that through, through theater and in our teaching? When I say theater, I mean performing arts, really, performing or creative that. expressions that we involve with. Um, okay. I think for me, it starts with terminology. I'm always bothered by these terminologies because they always refer to particular things that actually disregard the actual, disregard other people and other people's practices. And it's always undermines that. And unfortunately, the wound that we talk about, or the, the innocent that we talk about, that we, the, the victim, drives that. Do you understand? Do you understand? No, we, we teach our children the same thing. We think that actually classical music is much more better, much more beautiful, and much more no, no, than the actual tradition kind of music. We, we, we drive those systems and those, that kind of an education. And I think. It's, I mean, I'm, I was, we were talking the other day with Mark. I was saying that, you know, it, it, I'm not the theater or the performing arts that we are thinking is the future for us, is the realization that a particular important side or a recipe in what we have been cooking all along in this poticos, in this soup, we have left out a huge element of black recipe. And we've been actually being part of that cooking. All we are asking, all I'm asking is that is the recognition of that. And how mm. do we add, how do we excavate it? How do we recognize that a huge particular taste that might take us forward as a nation is been left aside, it's been forcibly archived or buried, um, or intentionally being sidelined so mm. that it can yield and feed into other cultures. Sure. And the future um, to recognize that and mm -hmm. act upon it. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and as a way of turning towards this question of aesthetics, right, um, it's very clear to me uh, that, that we're invested in this politics, right, that is about perhaps reclaiming these terms so that they account for a sense of plurality and even this kind of plur plural classicism, so I think is the term that Mark used earlier on. Um, but as a way of, I guess one of the things that I, I find really interesting here is, is, is this um, observation that you make is, is that in some ways there's 
in the European or kind of literary grounded um, dramatic traditions, there's a conflation between the traditional and the classical is that, for example, you know, ballet is spoken about as a kind of classical dance form and the, the subtext there is classical European. But I think as somebody mentioned in the previous talk, um, we're not talking about ballet as an ethnic art form, for example. Um, whereas dance that emerges from the same kind of period, from the same sort of history within Africa would be considered like ethnic African dance, right? Um, so there isn't that equivalence um, kind of meeting point of, of recognizing the traditional things that have been sustained over various, I mean, over a kind of long durée, as, as you said yesterday, Mark, um, as having the same status as these kind of classics from Europe. Um, and I guess two questions here. Um, is what then do we think the status of the European classics should be in our contemporary context, given the history that we've come from, and given that there is this, this imbalance, right? Um, this disequilibrium between um, the kinds of histories and practices and aesthetics that are privileged in, for example, our teaching environments, and the need to disinter um, indigenous forms from beneath that historical weight um, and perhaps overdetermination of European forms is the first part of my question. Right? Is, is do we see any value in in cleaving to those traditions, or is the work around reimagining them, remobilizing them to new purpose now? And then, second question is around what your work kind of looks like then in response to that and how the aesthetic choices you're making in some ways reflect on the politics that, that shape your work. Is there a place for something we might call the European canon in a uh, recovering settler colony like South Africa? Um, or should we be discarding these forms altogether, babies with bathwater and all that? I don't think I, the question I, I, is should. You know, carry on, <laughs> Yeah. No, I was I was going to say, Bongena. I'm, I'm also I am very aware of 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 trying to engage uh, uh, or fighting a losing battle in a way. So there is no way that you can discard or get rid of what we have learned. There is something is embedded in us. Uh, it, it, it will never be innocent from the global influences, no matter how negatively those global influences came to us. It is part of our identity now. Do, do, do understand? So uh, I, I cannot unlearn what I've learned through UCT since 1994 up until two to my master's in a way. Do, do understand? I cannot. That will always serve as both consciously and or unconsciously as an influence to the work that I do. What I'm conscious of is that something has been denied, which was me. I want to bring me into that particular table and say, this is me, you know? And I want that kind of tension to create that particular kind of work that I'm creating. So, so, mm. so in a way, you know, we, we cannot seek for purity because of, we will never have one. That, that's, that's quite a waste of time, I think. So, so in a way, we, we will always be an interdisciplinary uh, holding multiplicity as, a, as, as individual, also as a society and as a nation. And we cannot, we grow intercontinentally, interculturally, intertraditionally, we grow. We grow through many practices of our society. They might be politically, or they might be just for the mere fact that I got married to someone else from the other tradition. So we grow in, in a way. Uh, what I, when I watch a piece of theater, I will not be able to delete it in my head that it has inspired me or whatever it is, even if it's negative or what. So, so I think for me, what is quite important in the conversation is the realization is a realization that one particular part that is so important in the identity of our nation has been ignored its existence. It has been denied its platform and it has been silenced. And that, that's what caused and feed into the sickness and the violence of our society. That's one part. Mm. If, we, we, if we can just realize that, even by, by simple thing, by understanding that the fact that the particular language that is dominant in our country is not seen as an academic language, it's problematic. 
we are continuing playing and perpetuating the violence in the black body and in the black memory. And, and up until we realize that, but also up until we realize that there are other sources of knowledge that existed and they still exist and we still put them as not part of our teaching and not part of our academic, as not part of being smart or intelligent. We are still mm -hmm. digging graves for those identities and we are only causing violence, people getting sick, people are sick all over. In, in a way. And I think as, as, as in the art industry and if in our work, we should always find those points and those moments of saying that, what does it mean? What does it mean to put all these diversity in one place? What does it mean? What does it mean plural, what, what plurality means in our time? But what interdisciplinary means in our time when, it, when we speak of, of, of decoloniality? project mm. to understand. and for me that's what it is that's what it is it's 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 putting pieces of what seems to be in contradiction and put them together even if they cause tension it is through that tension that progression will make sense and will find way mm. but in any way mm. it is through those tension that a magical production or performance actually comes together it is the multiplicity mm. it mm. is multiple voices that comes together for me, do you understand? It is a group of people who come into a particular place and go and pray for that rain than an individual sitting in their room praying for that rain, do you understand? It is an allowance. It is an allowance of an overgrowing performance, that one, the one that is not chained by a particular script that cannot move in any form or, or any direction. It is the mm. script that is influenced by the people who are doing it at that particular moment. For me, that's that's that, mm -hmm. that that's that's the and direction. I also hear that. Mm. Thank you. I also hear that an interesting suggestion about the relationship between the individual and the community, right? As is perhaps how we value the one in relation to the other. Um, but yes, Manta, what you're saying also links to what I was saying or what Mark was um putting down about historicizing and can create some pluralities, right? So as for want of a better way, as a decolonial impulse that is open to us. Um, as, as practitioners. But Mark, you were saying that the question isn't necessarily should <laughs> we um, well, it's not about should we do it, anything. Um, I mean, I think, I think at the end of the day, the way that I look at it is we, and, and recently Mahmoud Mandani um, published a book um, in which he described the South African post-apartheid situation in such a way that where he, he described um, all those who um, remain after apartheid as survivors of the catastrophe. And mm. that those survivors, whether they were, who were previously um, enemies in a civil war became um, opponents in a democratic state, whether they liked that or not. And so what we what we have at the moment is a is a situation in which all have to battle out in the marketplace of ideas, so to speak, political ideas for uh, for a degree of power within that state structure. Um, for me, the catastrophe of colonialism or apartheid produces a landscape. Um, which can be defined um, in various ways, but I like to think it, uh, as a pile of ruins. And in that ruined space, um, there, are, there are a whole lot of remainders, right? And those remainders cannot be simply removed or got rid of or wished away. Um, in fact, that produces the, the tragic sense of the post-colonial moment because in that sense, you might not want to be there or you might not want to be with the people that you are with, but you don't have an option. You have to find a way to be together. Um, and this is the what is so interesting for me about tragedy, not as a form necessarily inherited from ancient Greece, but as a concept, is the sense of, of its, um, of, of being caught in a situation from which there is no obvious exit. There is no mm. simple way out 
there is only have uh, uh, the need or uh, the, the necessity to engage with um, with the reality as it plays itself out. So, so this idea of of individual freedom or the right or or my 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 freedom to do whatever I want is limited by the reality that we find ourselves in, and that reality, which has been shaped by colonialism, produces this ruined landscape which is full of contradiction, full of paradox, full of struggle. Um, mm. um, and one of the things, so recently I, I, I did a talk in the Netherlands about this project and thinking about uh, productions and reworkings of classical texts. And I described um, a particular walk um, that I've done often in a particular part of, of uh, the country here um, and in that walk um, which involves leaving from a particular domesticated farm space and moving into the the bush so to speak and along the way encountering a ruin and that ruin having a particular history and a particular politics attached to it and that ruin being um, doing a number of things um, one of which was to stop me in my tracks Another one, which is to force me to think in a particular way about the politics of the place, about the story of the place. But one of the things that the ruin does in this particular instance is it also hides the real reason why I went on that walk in the first place, which is that further along the path is a cave. And in that cave are paintings produced by the San people, the first um, hunter-gatherer communities, the first indigenous peoples of the Western Cape, certainly. Um, and, um, and that particular cave is hidden in so many ways. It's physically hidden by a whole almost veil of thorn trees that stop um, people from easily getting to them. But they also hide, um, so if you didn't know when you were walking along that path that there was a cave there, you would never go in and engage with those paintings. But the ruin is on the path. The ruin doesn't allow, doesn't hide. It's there in full view and it arrests progress in that way. And so for me, I'm interested in this relationship between the cave and the ruin. I'm interested in this relationship between the ruins preeminence and um, predominance in the landscape, the way it shapes a particular way of understanding um, uh, the world and experience in sense terms. Um, and then the um, the cave, which remains hidden, rem remains occluded in some kind of way, but also mm. contains this very interesting classical tradition. The other thing that that brings up, just by the mm. way, is the question of material classicism. So the, the mm. way in which um, we've spoken about orality and liter literacy, but also the sense in which the material constructions, painting, sculpture, um, and those kinds of things, material culture broadly, um, also produces a kind of classical tradition. And, and, and in that sense, you know, I think the painting, for example, of the San people, um, which is also connected to, um, and has been shown to be connected very strongly to a body of storytelling um, mm. and to uh, a series of ritual practices, um, trans practices, for example, um, is, is a very important element in this whole discussion. I suppose when I'm thinking about the place that, as you say, um, I don't think that anybody needs to do anything with the room unless they want to. Mm. Um, if they choose to, it provides something that they can use. And to that extent, I need to make the point that we're talking about classicism here, but the work that we make has, is not classical. Absolutely. It's contemporary. It's the work that we're making now, um, in a sense, about our experience of now. Um, mm -hmm. And in that sense, 
the classics operate in a foundational way. They operate in a way that produces um, the originating or um, uh, determining conditions for the contemporary. Mm. Right. So they they not they don't we're not talking about necessarily going back. So when when I do Antigone, I'm not doing Antigone as Antigone. Right. I'm doing Antigone for contemporary present day purposes now as a contemporary piece of theater. I'm not saying I'm doing this as a piece of classical theater. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. In in my own work, I think what I've seen in this is the development from a kind of what I would call narrative approach. So so I think there are three phases in which the classics, as in the Greek tragedy, for example, has manifested in South Africa. You, you have the early stage where where things are just produced um, as a kind of as if there was a correct way of doing them, right? Yeah, and they're being done in real. order to yeah. show. This is the correct way. This is what makes these things so great. This is the this is real theater, right? The second phase of the phase where the where people here begin to take those works, and particularly from a narrative perspective, they begin to relate the story of that work to the political conditions that they want to highlight. So the work that say an Apple Fugard does in the South African context with plays like um, his Arrestes project or the island, for example, um, are his attempt to take the story out of the Greek tragedy and to use it to make a political point in that particular period. Mm. But more recently, I think the adaptations are much more archival, coming back to Amanda's use of the archive, in the sense yeah. of seeing the play as part of this archival uh, archive and then taking from it what you want in order to produce something new, mm. not in order. So, so the, the integrity of the narrative breaks down. What you get in the ruins are a set of fragments. And those fragments and the relationship between the original meaning of those works or the intention of those works and the way those works are being taken up and used in the present is breaks up, breaks down, right? Mm. So, mm. so in a sense, uh, um, and, and here I've spoken to Mandla here, if you take uh, the perspective produced, uh, put forward by Derrida around the difference between an inheritance and a debt, Ryan, mm. I think for, for a theater maker like me, um, coming from where I'm coming from in this context, I am indebted to this tradition in a way that I think Mandla is not, Ryan. Um, I think that, that there is a difference and a debt is something that needs to be repaid at a certain point. And mm. there is a way in which that connection, whereas in inheritance, you supposedly can do anything you want with. Right. So the question is, um, if the, the, there is no doubt to me that there is a joint inheritance here, that, mm. that, that someone, a theater maker like Mandler cannot ignore the way he has been formed. You just said it. Right. Mm. He has inherited this tradition, and why shouldn't he inherit the tradition? Right. Just because it came from Europe. He has mm. inherited this tradition, and he will make of the tradition what he wants. He will take, as he is now with Ichele, taking Homer's Odyssey and making Homer's Odyssey work for his conception of the world. He's not even taking Homer's Odyssey, he's taking fragments and using them in the way that he wants to use them to, to make his work. But when I do Antigone, I'm caught between the sense of indebtedness to this tradition that supposedly made me as a, as a European, uh, as an African of European descent, if you like, as, as, as part of that settler community, right? I, I have this, this burden of debt <laughs> that I am mm. committed to this tradition in some kind of way. Um, mm. Um, and in a sense, I have to work very hard to, to disconnect myself from the integrity of that, of, from the, that understanding of that as being in some way um, of great distinctive value that it needs to be preserved in the way that it was written and the way that it was produced and then redone uh, in mm. an African context in some kind of mm. way. Mm, mm, mm. 
Thank you, Prof. Um, yes. Well, no, I was just, I mean, to pick up some of the points that Mark uh, 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 has been saying, but also to try and relate to some of the things um, that I'm, I'm, I mean, as, as the conversation um, is going on, I'm, I'm just thinking about certain things that that also drives or that have become a pull factor to the work that I do and how I do that work. I mean, the other one is, you know, there's this notion that if it's written down, it's if and if anything is written down, it indicates it's as it's as if it's it's the first thing or the first time to be done. Do mm -hmm. So so if you understand that if it has never been written down in a way, because of if you it read it in a particular right. book, it yeah. feels that they were the first people to do it. So my first impulse when I deal with with the text and when I deal with concepts in the text, when I deal with the particular stories, even if that story comes from the other way, I want to find out if such thing, such structure, such style existed, even if it was never written. So I think also there's those politics of orality and, and the written work that there's quite a lot of, 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 of placing power in the written forms that, that it, in a way it does delete the orality or the existence of something before it was written in a particular part of that of of of, of that country, and that, that that that's problematic. I mean, we see it in contemporary politics of of actors making work and stuff when it's written, it, be, it becomes or it belongs to someone else. That you know, so, so that's one part. And then the other part, I think, I guess one of my desire was the fact that when we refer to the work that we do, people will say that is so Krotowski. That is so Stanislavski. That is so Dondoni. And I was desiring to say that that is so traditional oral tradition of storytelling. You understand? When, when we see a physical theater, when we see a musical theater, I, I wanted to be, to be able to say that that so reminds me of my grandmother's storytelling as a performance because of that can be traced and be linked into that particular place. But because of the knowledge and education that we involved in denies those things. And actually those experiences and those forms that every time we refer to certain things, we continue giving power to the word that is written down and that has been dished upon ourselves. And that's mm -hmm. problematic. Even mm -hmm. now in this conversation, we continue doing that. That to understand that for me, even if in 1920s, the black intellectuals started writing and all those things. We started realizing maybe that the way uh, uh, that was written by S.E. Ken Kai was one of the classical work of Isikosa. But they were classical mm. work of Isikosa of Nguni people long before the missionaries came, long before they were educated and stuff. So it became part of the conversation because of it was written down. So my, yeah. my desire is to say that my work, first and foremost, is influenced by the oral tradition of storytelling of rituals and performing traditions that are happening in, in my society. And, and it, 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 I mean, for me, that's quite important. Um, mm -hmm. I thought, let me, just, let me just mention that and, and, and as, as a point of importance in our conversation. Yeah, no, great, thank you. Can I, can um, I, and, and you know, sorry, yes, Mani, Mani. Mm. I just want to point out that I think it's important to recognize that even within the so-called Western tradition of performance, mm. there is this distinction that had developed historically over time uh, between forms of uh, popular performance, if you like, or forms of performance Absolutely. that were non-literary and driven by, through the body, often through uh, practices of improvisational play, etc., and that, is, that tradition, uh, the most famous of one, which is obviously the Commedia dell'arte, but, but other forms um, of, 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 of work, um, was in a kind of competition with uh, the literary. It, only at a certain point that writing comes in and scripting of performances becomes something within even the Western tradition. And then slowly a hegemony begins to develop in which the dramatic is associated with a pre-written script, right? And all those other, um, for want of a better word, mime traditions um, uh, kind of then take a secondary position. They kind of slip into the margins because they're not real theater because they don't start oh. from a written script in some kind of way. And, and all the skills yeah, associated not... with that, the play and all of that, becomes denigrated relative to the particular, uh, the way of playing 
um, a, a written text becomes mm. the predominant way of training active, you know, and, mm. I, and I was speaking to Mandela about this yesterday, about the way we go about training actors. So despite mm. these discussions that we have, we still conceptually think of the actor training in South Africa as beginning with or being determined by a script or scripting process of some kind. Mm. And the, the skills that an actor learns are the skills that start from the text. So it doesn't matter how much we develop alternative ways of making through what we might call workshop theater or devising or, or whatever, we still mm. have somewhere subconsciously the idea that what we are doing is making a text, a script. And the yeah. ability to free ourselves from the dominance of that script, right? Mm. And, and if we go back to those African oral traditions and the storytelling traditions, it's a completely different way of doing it. The script emerges in the performance. It doesn't exist prior to the performance. What exists mm. are a set of, of images and a and tradition points, of yeah. stories that are, mm. um, that are learned through participation over time. But mm. in the moment of performance, the performance is, 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 ex, is happening extemporary. It's happening in an improvisational way relative to the, the particularities of that time and that place and the community. And the community that is listening, the so-called audience, is a participant in those things. It is part of the process of bringing forth the performance. But we and still guess, don't yeah. teach our acting students to do yeah. that. But, yeah. but I guess, yeah. but I guess, Mark, sorry, but I guess also by embarking on the devised processes of making theater with a group of people, in a way, you achieve that particular element because of you come into the particular space with a core image, in that core image might be a title, but at the end, the audience, which is the first instance, your cast members in that space, they start bringing in a way that you. You might not be just a storyteller, but you are led and you are being led by the participant of making that theater. So that freedom mm -hmm. of different kinds of experiences of individuals that are bringing with construct what is called or what will be called in future a performance. But during the making of itself, you perform for each other in a way. You understand mm -hmm. that you perform for each other yeah. using the comic being contained by that particular kind of image. And then when in other instances for that matter, in different kinds of, of things, even if we are guided, I think, I guess, you know, the script also means that in our head, it means that the, the beginning and the end is clear in terms of the time frame, because it must always be clear in terms of the time frame. So there's be that kind of, of, of container. But the, I think for me, the allowance of its fragmentation within the contained kind of time frame and within the contained kind of core image that holds everything together. The allowance of breathing, it for me, that for me is quite important even in the performance because of that holds that kind of, it's not scripted and it's not in a way um, cut and stone. It, it doesn't, it must not mm -hmm. be touched. It, it allow itself to be, to be changed and to be, and, and to be shifted and, and to allow the audience responses to, to, to actually influence the performance itself and stuff. There are those kinds of performances that follow through through the process of making into oh. the performance. But there are those ones that I, 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 I guess, again, we, we, are, we are being prisoned by the notion that if it, if it needs to be professional and all those kinds of things, it must end up with a script. Whatever processes you've gone through, it must end up with something that's written down for it to be realized mm. as something else as the script oh. and as, as the professional theater. And I think that's one of the, yeah. Great. Jens and, and, and guests in the room, I must apologize. I've been an absolutely terrible facilitator here. I've not been paying attention to the chat where so many interesting questions have come up because I've been so wrapped up in listening to these lovely offerings. But I think um, John made a really interesting point here um, where he, he says, you know, um, it might be useful to borrow the this idea that a language, quote, is a dialect with an army and a navy. Um, and then ask, you know, do enduring models, the classical cultural practices, only maintain their privileged status through political power? And what you've both indicated in this last moment is this idea that writing perhaps begins to function in that way. Um, John, I don't know if I'm, if I'm uh, missing. 
speaking on your behalf, forgive me, but it seems to me that 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 the army and the navy have in some ways been supplanted by the primacy of, of the written text, um, whether in terms of that as the point of access to um, how we train, but also about how these, these objects, right, that we create circulate after the initial event, is that they become available in particular ways, and, and the way that they become available also determines the kind of power that they might hold. Um, internationally or outside of the spaces where we first encounter them. Um, colleagues, it's 11.02, we're two minutes past the hour when the official conversation technically ends. Um, but as is the practice, we normally kind of carry on in a more informal way um, after the hour for about 15 minutes or so. Um, so I invite you to please continue hanging out and chatting with us. But just to say thank you for those of you who do need to shoot, because I know that we schedule for an hour. Um, thank you for joining us again. And thank you, Mark and Mandler, for your incredibly rich offerings here. Um, and we continue. <laughs> and again, if anyone has any questions, please um, also feel free to wave at me because my eye is, as I said, not necessarily watching the chat at every moment. Um, but yeah, on we go. So, um, Jehan, you also had an interesting kind of thought earlier on about the traditional versus the classical, although we've moved on from there. I just, uh, very quickly, um, I'm just finding, I thought it was fascinating. I, I didn't feel like getting into any questions or thoughts of my own because listening mm -hmm. to Mark and Mandla just uh, sort of speak on everything was just such a great listening. So thank you for that. Uh, I do, I, I think I was just completely uh, taken with this idea of traditional versus classical, having this idea of produced by an individual in the group, which is what Mark originally said. And I just immediately thought of like how, you know, our current sort of idea of uh, just ownership, possession, that is the product in which the power lies. Uh, the fact that there's something recordable, then recreatable, and uh, its role in all of this. Um, but the other thing I'm seeing, uh, which I, which I'm just trying to uh, figure out how to, to 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 phrase, is because something that Mandla said, which is terminology undermines stuff, but yet at the same time we're all in search for identity, and that requires some kind of terminology, and so there's this tension there that I'm thinking about. Um, these are just really thoughts. Uh, these are it's not it's not so much a statement. Because mm -hmm. what I'm trying to figure out is, what I'm trying to figure out over here is going forward, how do we work towards this plurality uh, in terms of our training methodologies, in terms of the text, in terms of the content, in terms of the processes, um, and how much do they have to stay? I mean, I think everything we're doing is for the present and for the now. Everything we're teaching mm -hmm. our students is for the present. And we use like magpies from everywhere. At least that's what our practice has been. Uh, we take whatever serves our purpose for that moment and we throw, throw out the rest. Um, but at the same time, it's almost like with a, without the mindfulness of acknowledgement of where those things came from and whether they were things that are forced upon us or denied from us. Um, and I'm just looking at all the dynamics at play. And so what you've really done with this conversation has just opened up like the act of choosing the pedagogy, the act of choosing the content, the act of choosing the approach has all of the stuff that you both spoke about today. Um, mm. And so I'm trying to look at where, I think my quest is, is where does a real plural, plural, plurality lie in terms of how we go about curating uh, a learning and teaching experience for the next batch of drama school students. Um, mm. Great, thank you, Jehan. Um, I see Ongazwa Mbele has a hand up as well. Ongazwa? Hi, everyone, and thank you uh, for the conversation. Um, I'll, um, Mandla, Open Mandla spoke about something that the, the, the victim drives the wound. And, I, and it, I, it just, it was quite um, interesting um, in that, I'm it's a question for you here. And so, so you, in saying that the victim drives the wound, it, from your experience, in, how is, does this happen in terms of representation 
and various representations are in performance and in terms of just the form that, that the, this wound is driven. If you can, I, I don't know if that question makes sense. I'm trying, but I just really, I'm thinking through what you said and I, it, it, it's, it knows at me. Um, hi, August. Um, I, I'm not sure if I maybe I was, was clear enough. I, I think maybe let me first start with that, that statement of what I meant for me. Mm. Um, that the, the, one of the successes of colonialism and, and apartheid was to make it in a point that whereas that it might seem not to be practiced, but we, the people that have been the victim of it, carrying it on, teaching it to our children. Um, uh, so in a way, there are black people who still says that there is no point of Isikosa or Isizulu to their children because of the success for their children is based on English and in other forms. So we drive that wound in, in a way. We become, the victim become the perpetuators of that. You know, also that we see that also, in, in, in other elements, we see that in gender-based violence also, in, in a way, where, where what to so, uh, and, and, and that for me, it's the wound on its own. Do you understand? So, so the work that we should be doing, it should be in search for, 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 for that healing. So I, I had a conversation, I said, even if in, 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 in is it Tosa kind of making theater in the classroom, my teaching and my directorial kind shit that is happening there is dominated by English. Do you understand? So in a way, while I'm trying to ascertain and, 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 and revive the beauty and the importance of his cause in my own processes in a way that, because of I'm the victim that I have no language, that my memory of my own language is so far that I can't even reach. Even if I struggle doing that, that the kids that I'm teaching themselves will take what I'm teaching and continue the similar thing that I do with them. By so, so in a way that I, I, I think one of the things that we need to do, I, I think is, but also I think that the challenge about searching for healing in a highly pressured time that we are so rushed that the time itself, it's a, we live in a microwave kind of, time frame that things need to be done, results need to happen now, and all those kinds of things that certain kinds of transformation and dealing with, with the actual wound is so rushed that, I mean, our society as South African, we know that we were thrown uh, rainbow bandages before even the wound was treated. And, and we live now in that time where the past is coming out and we need to deal with it. But still, the time frame of dealing with that wound is not enough. The time frame of teaching what we want to teach in our universities is not enough because of the periods that we have and the time frame of the production that we have might not allow certain rituals or certain practices of performances that we like to reincorporate in our teaching. The time always becomes the sense of, in a way, you know, um, it, it's been stolen from us in a way. So. Um, uh, um, and, and you know, I, I, I mean, I, 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 in the conversation that we've been having, I mean, um, with with Mark, I, I even, you know, there was a there was a time that, actually, even I, I think even now that I, I I accepted, maybe that's a tragedy of things that we will never find healing. Do you understand? But it is it is in the search of that healing that we become better people. That we get little bit is into the pain that we suffer. It is in that search. And I think for me, that's quite important. But to say that one in one particular part of our lives, we will find healing. We will find, we will find harmony in, in this diversity. We will find, I, I, I don't know, but I think our act is to search for it. And it is in that search of that meaning, of that healing that the healing is in the process, not in the end results. So we all need to continue to go to the therapy. 
Because the moment you stop, you go back to pain. You can't stop it. Yeah. That's a tragedy of it. I think that's what Mark also referred to in, into that. Such in such conversations and in such kind of, of, of thing. So um yeah. Sure, oh, 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 I mean, that, that, yeah. Sorry, Mbongeni. So to go back to the pedagogy question and, and things that people have said, like Alex said in the in the uh, chat, and Mandla was talking about time and in relation to the difficulties of working within a colonial colonially imposed structure and epistemological framework within the university or the theater school in, 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 in a South African context now. Um, the magnet training program tried to, to deal with that in a different kind of way by not being so rigidly uh, determined by time periods and by um, uh, the necessity to do an exam by a certain date and to produce a set of results and do all of those kinds of things. So in the beginning, there was a much more organic approach to the pedagogy, the, the, the choice of, of, of exercise, the choice of material, the way we work was much more determined by the flow of what was happening in the room with the student. And that felt kind of quite freeing relative to the experience of working in the university. Um, but Jenny and I were talking about this this morning that, that in a sense over time, the demands of the world outside and the demands of the industry and of the funders who put money into these programs and demand results in the form of how many people got jobs, how many people were able to support their families as a result of this training, means that the, the, the teaching closes down and we start to look for easy outcomes very clearly definable, but quite superficial outcomes. And a lot of those outcomes are based again on what the structure of the industry demands. So the ability to work with a script, the ability to read a text, the, the ability to interpret a character in the sense in which, in the, the Western sense of the word, all of those kinds of things become necessary in order to empower those graduates to be able to find jobs when they leave so that you can attract more funding, right? But in fact, what that does is it works against those very processes that you had in place in the first instance, which were not in the primarily text-based, that, that had open-ended periods of time that followed the development of this, that particular student cohort as, and what do they need as opposed to setting particular objectives. And so it's, it's a really difficult thing um, in, in some way, it, it's almost like the, um, the, the institutions in which we work produce a set of conditions that make whatever we want to do or what we believe in very difficult to achieve. Um, uh, and, and, and that's a challenge. I, I don't know of a way of, of being able to, to overcome at the moment. Um, yeah. You're on mute, Mgeni. Apologies. I'll say thank you. And I want to circle back to that point in a second by asking other people in the room who teach, you know, what their own thinking is around this. Um, but before we do so, I just wanted to give Jehan a moment to um, introduce next week's talk um, and tell us a bit more about that before we close the official part of the session. Sorry, I misspoke earlier on. It's 11.15, not 11. It was my excitement at the hour. Um, Jehan? Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mandla, on behalf of all of us gathered here um, for doing this. And I hope you can come back to the next session uh, and the session after that, um, because it seems to have picked up a thread from um, when your session last week, um, where we're really trying to figure out somewhere, um, how do we work with what we have all uh, either inherited or taken on as debt um, to uh, move forward and how do we teach with that? Uh, or, and my session uh, uh, next week is on a quest on, on trying to see where, 
in this big sort of landscape of you know pluralism and plurality um where are the universal truths and how can we work with them um the reason uh, uh, the person coming in is going to be shankar venkateshwaran he's just an amazing um theater practitioner uh, he's trained in so many intercultural contexts and he's had a very fascinating journey over the last 20 to 30 years uh with working across cultures and across different landscapes of forms texts people uh production modes and he seemed to be of the opinion in my pre chat with him that there's no such thing as the universal anymore and i want to challenge that because i keep uh i will start with a story about that um why we can teach at the drama school mumbai with so many different people coming from so many different forms and and spaces of theater and yet try and make an uh, a, a well framed or well uh, created theater maker um so that's my talk and then the week after that uh, amy continues the quest differently amy you want to share um thanks jehan yes i'll be inviting paula coletto and dr cass fleming for a discussion uh, entitled masterless women teaching physical theater so we'll be having a subversive oh. chat about um why it seems to be that um all the physical theater traditions almost all of them are named after men when in fact there were so many women uh developing them and practicing them so uh please join us for that um very uh uh interesting hopefully interesting conversation fantastic thank you both 